Are you in Suzuki Book 3? Then this is the video for you. Today I'll be covering number 8, which is Humoresque by Dvorak. Hi, my name is Liz from Cellomozy.com and I give you tips and tools so that you can learn to play the cello. So this is part of my slow play series where I purposely play through the song nice and slow so that you can hear all of the rhythms and the notes and how they fit together with the accompaniment. Here I'll be playing quite slowly because I'll be keeping track of the eighth note beat. So what I'm doing is setting my metronome beat so that the eighth note is represented on the metronome and I set my metronome to 62. Remember, this is not the final tempo. If you are planning to play this for a performance or you're trying to demonstrate to your teacher that you really know this song well, make sure you play it at the proper speed. 62 is just so that I can show you like how things are fitting together, but it is by no means a final tempo at all. Before we dive into anything, let's explore the music itself is written in two different keys. So it starts out in D major, as you can see, it has two sharps, the F sharp and C sharp. And then midway through, it changes so that there's only one flat in the key signature. Now, if you have been reviewing scales or learning scales in your lessons, you may know that when there is one flat in the key signature, it could be F major. But here, it can be a little bit ambiguous. It could also be D minor. So D minor is the relative minor. It also only has one flat in the key signature. So if you know the D minor scale, I recommend that you practice the D minor scale. It's kind of a nice contrast, D major to D minor. But no worries, if you don't know the D minor scale yet, then definitely at least practice the F major scale because then you'll actually have these tonalities in your ear and it'll be a lot easier to match intonation when you are learning this song. So in this number eight, just as an overview, we are exploring a lot of different skills here. So we are learning about changing keys in the middle of a song. We are learning different positions and learning to maneuver and change between different positions nice and smooth and cleanly. We are learning to use our grace notes a lot easier. So those are those little notes that you can find throughout the song. And then also we are learning about characters of sound. If you look at the change of key, to me when I'm hearing it, I think of it almost like a different type of sound production, a different type of character that you want to bring out. So it is really important to kind of just take a nice overview of this so you can be aware of the things that are coming up. Remember, now that you're advancing more into music, it kind of goes beyond just like learning to play the notes and like the rhythms. You really want to kind of capture more of the style, the character of the piece, and think about what is the best type of sound that you can make out of your cello to really make this music come alive. Okay, so now let's address what probably a lot of you may be thinking if you're looking at this for the first time. How does this beginning part of the song go? There's all these like fast-ish looking notes and slurs and it looks really, really complicated. But I want to remind you that when it comes to complicated rhythms, you've got to learn to break things down. So in other words, you want to learn to subdivide the beat. So just as a quick review, if you take a quarter note and you divide it into 16th notes, that means that there are going to be four 16th notes in a quarter note. But as you can see here, there are some 32nd notes. So actually, let's think about a quarter note divided into 32nd notes. 32nd notes, keep in mind, that's the note that has three bars or three flags connecting them. That means those are 32nd notes. Don't confuse them with 16th notes, which only have two. So 32nd notes, if you're dividing a quarter note uh, into 32nd notes, that would be eight 32nd notes. Now, reality is, is like, it's really hard to count like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight while you're playing it. That's just really confusing. So what you might want to do is think about it in groups of four. So there are two groups of four in every quarter note. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and those would equal a quarter note. Okay, so let's talk about the first four notes in humoresque. So you're starting out with a 16th note, there's a 32nd, another 16th, and another 32nd. So as we talked about subdividing, if we think of it in terms of 32nd notes, I'm holding one, two, blank, four, right? So the blank would be three, the third 32nd note, and then I'm playing on the four. So I'll play that again. It's one, two, rest, four. And then you're going on to the next one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So remember, when you're figuring out rhythms and pitches, 
I often recommend don't worry so much about the slurs. I know that we always want to try to put everything all together all at once, but if it's really confusing, simplify it, get down the pitches and the rhythms, and then add the slurs later. In the beginning, that's how you can think about subdividing these beats. So if I was to play the first measure, one, two, three, four, one, like definitely super 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 slow we'll get to the speed and and all of that but I really want you guys to just understand how we subdivide the beat because later on when you're finding complex rhythms then you too can subdivide these things and kind of break it down to easier chunks and then you can play it and be accurate and feel confident in that so like I said I know the slurs can be a little bit confusing but just remember the subdivision and the rhythms and it will all come together. Now, if you look at the next page, which is page 19 in my version of the Suzuki book, they actually give you a preliminary practice number one. And here in the exercise A, they actually give you this sort of example of what you can practice with the fast note. What they are doing is they're taking all of the slurs in this first section from measure one through measure eight and they are kind of taking it out of context so that you can practice the speed of it. So I'll show you what that is. So if I was to take just the very first slur in measure one, so that's a connection between an E and a D, it would be pretty quick. You can practice this. And you can practice that several times in a row, which I would highly recommend. So in the preliminary practice, they're having you practice it on the E and D having you practice it on the B and A. But I think here, after you get comfortable with that, you can kind of take it one step further. So here's what I would recommend you do. So if you look at that first section from measure one through measure eight, you can practice all those tiny little slurs. So for example, the ones in measure one would be the E and D, which we already did. Then if you look at the next two notes or the next slur, it's from an E to an F sharp. So practice that. So you're noticing that they're short notes, right? And they're not necessarily a long, short, long, short, but it's more of a short, long, short, long. If you go to the next slur, that's from an A to a B. Right? So then, if you look at the final slur of measure one, which goes into measure two, then that is practicing the A to the D. So I would practice that as well. So these little slurs are the ones that I would practice going back and forth through until you feel comfortable. And then you can kind of link them all together. So. something that you can break down things into smaller chunks and then put them all back together in the end. So next, let's talk about positions. Now, some of you may already know that I don't really buy into sort of defining the middle positions. So what I mean by middle positions are like second position and third position. A lot of the times when I instruct my private students, I usually only refer to three positions. First position, fourth position up here, and then thumb position, which is when we start using our thumb to play the cello. I mean, if you think about it, at the end of the day, you really just have to find the notes and be able to play the notes. And actually knowing what position it is, I find is not super helpful. It's more about, okay, where's the note on your cello and how am I gonna get my hand to go there and play all the notes? So something just to keep in mind that Suzuki is really nice where they're putting these nice little brackets out and showing you where second and third position is. But just keep in mind that once you are out of the Suzuki books, no one is really that nice uh, when you're in orchestra or other solo pieces of music. They're not going to put these nice little brackets telling you, hey, this is second position, this is third position. They're going to expect you to just be able to find the note and play that. So just keep that in mind as you are learning your way through the cello that you really just want to try to memorize the geography of your fingerboard. So you're also going to see parentheses and alternative fingerings that are written in them. Now, this is totally up to you which fingering you choose to do. 
I would always recommend that you learn both options of the fingerings and then you can decide for yourself which one it is that you want to do. Keep in mind that uh, learning these two options is always going to be beneficial. You're just adding more tools to your toolbox so later on you're able to do multiple different fingerings and you're not stuck with just like one option of playing a note. And as you're playing through it, you'll learn to find that your hand is going to prefer one fingering over the other. Uh, so it is always good practice to explore your options and keep stretching your abilities. Okay, so in measure nine, we come up to our first big jump. So that is going from an F sharp, and hopefully you're reading this note too. The second note is also an F sharp. So it's what we call an octave apart. So when you encounter these big jumps, make sure that you are practicing the jump itself. So in this case, we're going from an F sharp here, and then you have to go to the A string F sharp. So I would highly recommend you practice just the jump like this. to keep my bow still while I'm moving my left hand. I'm not trying to like test along the way and you definitely don't want to hear these these sort of slidey things. Play your note, stop, move, and then move your bow. That way you can really be sure that okay my arm has to move this much and you're not testing or sort of kind of sort of finding the interval. This is gonna come real handy when you are playing this up to speed. Another way is you can actually practice finding a note in what I call the one shot rule. So all that means is put your hand all the way down to your lap so there's no muscle memory in here and you shake out your hand and then you give yourself just one chance or one shot to find that F sharp. So here I'm down here and then I have only one chance to put my hand down and then once it's down I can't wiggle it around and then I'm trying to play that F sharp. You'll find that after a while doing this and also practicing the shift, your body is going to start to develop muscle memory so that you'll be able to find these notes with ease. So definitely try these exercises. Okay, going to measure 11. Now we have a fingered A as an optional fingering. And if you do the fingered A, it's a little bit of a jump as well. But you have the benefit of actually playing the open A and then you go to the fingered A. So if I'm coming from measure 10, I'm here. I just played the last two eighth notes of measure 10. And then as I'm playing that open A, I'm traveling so that I can find the fingered A on the D string. So it's nice because you can really truly tell if your note is in tune or not. But it's also tricky because if it's not in tune, then it's really obvious, right? Because it's supposed to sound like the same note. Again, always keep in mind, this is just an alternative fingering. It is not a essential, you must do this fingering. But I like to challenge my students to try to learn both and show me both fingerings. Especially as you're getting into more advanced music, you're going to find that the fingered A is going to be a common fingering. Whether it's with two or some other finger, that part doesn't really matter. But you can already probably start to hear how bright a normal open A string can be on the cello. So learning to find this fingered A on the D string is going to be to your advantage. So in measure 25, this is where we start to explore sort of different characters in music. To me, I think it's always helpful to imagine that, you know, there's a little storyline or characters or adjectives, colors, however it helps you to define each section. So this section in 25 is very different than the beginning. The beginning even says leggero, which means light. So you can tell by the style of the piece that's going on that it has this light sort of playful character. Now in 25, it gives you a forte. And I like to say, try to create a nice rich sound. Which is very different than the beginning, which is more light. So it doesn't mean that the, the tempo changes or anything like that, okay? I know it says a tempo, which means return to the tempo, but keep in mind the measure before there was a little ritardando, which means to slow down a little bit. So that's why they're saying in 25 to return back to the original tempo. 
It's just the same tempo, but it has a little bit different character to it. So at the end of measure 32, if you're doing the fingering properly, and it doesn't matter if it's the upper one or the lower one, you will already be in position for measure 33. Oftentimes I see that people move into position and then they see like a familiar note and they want to like move immediately back to first position. So keep in mind 32 to 33 when you're on the A. If you're on the two, you just have to extend back one for the D. Or if you're playing a three on that A, then your one is right there on that D. 36, there is another big shift. So guess what? You want to practice the shift. So this one's a pretty big one. You're starting from the C and then you have to go all the way up here to the G. Now, when you see these large jumps, okay, it's literally not a jump where you lift your hand up and then you're coming down here. You want to be able to slide your hand on the string. Always have that connection with the string and you'll feel a lot calmer trying to find this note. But if you saw, I play the C, stop my bow, then I move in order to keep that note nice and clean. You don't want to hear this. Those sliding noises makes it sound just really sloppy and messy and just not a good sound quality. And also keep in mind, this is only a G. So normally we play the G with our fourth finger. So you can totally try to find the note first with your comfortable finger and then substitute it with your two. And then you can practice that shift up and down. You can also always double check this G with your open G. apart so you'll be able to hear how those notes match. In this measure here, the next note is going to be an A. Now if you have learned a harmonic A, this is not the place to use it. Harmonic A is actually going to be harder because you have to let go of your other fingers and that's not going to set you up for the next three notes. So when your two is down on the G, your A should just come down nice and solid. Yes, you can always check with your open A. But I'm not trying to play a harmonic A. Always make sure your fingers are down here. And when my two is down, my one is trying to get ready for that F natural that's about to come up. So G, then A, G, right? A, G, F. So this is a little bit awkward because it is a stretch. So when you're doing it though, if your fingers are all in line, when you do the slur, it'll be really easy. All right, measure 40, it goes even higher. So I challenge you to figure out what the note is first. So if you took some time to count all those ledger lines in the note, you should see that that highest note is going to be a high C. And then after that C will be a B flat, and then you're going to end on the A. So I know it seems a little bit intimidating, but think about it this way. You just found your A with your three. Now all you have to do is switch it out for your one. Now, if your hand is really small or you feel like your fingers are really short, then sure, you might be tempted to kind of bring your thumb out a little bit more. But one thing that you don't want to see is have your thumb hanging off here. This is not going to give you any security because if anything, your hand is just going to fall off to the side here. So what I recommend is Normally here, we are hooked back here. Now, if reaching the C is too high, then just bring it out a little bit more to the side here. But notice my thumb is always connected to the cello. It is not like hanging off here. Yes, this is kind of borderline getting into thumb position. So some people might opt to just bring their thumb out here. And you can notice that when I bring it out, it's nice and balanced. I'm not trying to do it like this where my hand is all spread out. And you can also notice my hand is like flat and is bending backwards, that is not the position you want to be in. You want your fingers to stay nice and curved and be right on top of the notes so it's really balanced on the top. So the big shift here is from the D and then you have to go all the way to the C. And I get it, the C might be like, I don't even know what it should sound like, but guess what? You can always check that with your open string. do and you can always check it with your A so there's the D to the C shift notice stop your bow move your hand 
and then play. And then C to B flat. And B flat to A. So if you want to see the spacing, C with your ring finger and B flat, there's going to be a little bit of a gap. But B flat to A, that's only a half step, so keep those two fingers close and you'll have a much more accurate uh, intonation if you keep your fingers like that. Okay, also remember that fermata note A is not a harmonic A. If you can, play it solid, and if you're up to it too, try to add a little bit of vibrato to it. Keep it nice and good sounding. When you are playing this C, it's really commonly seen where people kind of like rest on this nice little shelf here on the cello, so make sure you're not resting like this and trying for it because it's gonna be really awkward and kind of strain your hand a lot. I always like to say you want at least a little bit of like uh, space between your hand and the cello, at least a paper width. But if you're looking at my arm here, you're hopefully noticing that this is one nice straight line. I'm not sort of bending my arm like this and I'm not bending it out this way either. You want it kind of nice and fluid. If you need to double check it, you can do this. Start from all the way in first position, slide your hand all the way up and down like this and your arm is automatically going to be at the right height. If it's not, you're going to notice you're going to bang into the side here and then lift it up and then go like this. So it's like a two-step thing, which you don't want. No hand slams, as I like to say, and you go up and down smoothly like this. So now you are in the home stretch, which is 41 to the end. And guess what? I know it seems intimidating, but you've already played this section. This section is actually identical to the beginning of this song. All right, so I talked a lot about the technical bits of this piece of music, but let's keep in mind this is music. So after you kind of figure out a lot of the tricky bits with the uh, intonation, rhythm, you really want to make it sound like music. So pay attention to things like the dynamics that are in this music or the style sort of in the beginning when it says Leggero, make it sound nice and light and kind of easy going and then you know the contrasting section and then back to the light at the end. You really want to try to bring these out and it really makes a difference to the listener and it will give you an extra little challenge and make it more fun for yourself as well.
So there you have number eight, Humoresque, which is found in Suzuki Book 3. I know there are a lot of things to keep track of, so take your time with it and try not to get too frustrated. Break it down into little pieces and you're going to find success in playing this one. If you have any questions that I didn't answer in this video, be sure to leave them in the comment box below. Also, if you like my slow play series, give me a thumbs up so that I know to continue on with this slow play series. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so and the bell next to it so you won't miss out on any other cello emoji videos. Have you joined my newsletter yet? I like to send out some extra little goodies such as downloads and extra tips in my email newsletter. So I'll leave that link below if you wanna join in on some more cello emoji information. Check out the videos on your screen right now for some other slow play series videos as well as some other videos that'll help you on your cello journey. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.